all the panelists. So let's await uh, a few more seconds to allow them to join uh, back um, or to join for today's uh, roundtable. Um, okay, I think, yes, I think everyone is here. So uh, thank you uh, everyone for being back for uh, to this last uh, session of the school. I just uh, counted uh, the number of uh, uh, sessions we have and believe it or not, this is session number 52. So uh, I think that this was a, a long and exciting marathon and we are now in the last, uh, in the very last kilometer of this uh, marathon. So this session is a, a round table with uh, many panelists that you had the opportunity to know in the last uh, uh, three weeks. So it's my pleasure to welcome again uh, Stefano Lesina, uh, Daniel Fisher, Jonathan Levin, Matteo Mazzilli, Mercedes Pasquale, Daniel Segre, and Justin Ike. Um, so thank you very much for giving the lectures and for being here to uh, this uh, round table. So the way uh, I'd like to organize this uh, round table is to try to have a sort of a spontaneous and uh, self-sustained uh, discussion among panelists and uh, also including you uh, participants. So before we start, just a few engagement rules. So if you are a participant and if you are following from YouTube, you can post a question in the chat and I'll try to find the time to redirect them to the panelists. If you are on Zoom, as usual, uh, now you know it uh, very well, you can either type the question in the chat or use the raise and feature. Also, uh, the panelists, if you want to say uh, something, just, and uh, I uh, don't give you the word, just uh, use the raise and uh, tool or write me in the chat. So the, the title of this uh, round table is uh, Going Big uh, Challenges and Opportunities in High Dimensional Ecosystems. And uh, this title without hiding it in plain sight is an interpolation uh, of the title of the chapters that some of the panelists have written in this book here, which is Unsolved Problems in Ecology, and an interpolation also between the lectures of uh, this school. So the two uh, keywords, in my opinion, that naturally emerge uh, from the lectures and uh, the, the chapters of the book are coexistence. Uh, so the why and the how uh, of species coexistence in uh, large communities. So in some sense, the most fundamental question of uh, ecology, because it's basically asking why ecology exists in the first place. And the other word is dimension. The fact that in large community, there is a, a lot of variation on multiple axes, including uh, um, many species, many conditions, many traits, many functions. So uh, the fact that in the title, uh, we talk about going big and high dimensional strongly suggests that uh, much of the intuition about coexistence and uh, ecological dynamics comes instead from very low dimensional theories and models, for instance, two species competition. And in some sense in the title is also implied that uh, this intuition should fail when we move to high dimensional ecosystems, right? Uh, so I'd like to have a first uh, round of uh, answers from uh, all the past panelists about the following uh, questions. So do you think that our intuition that we shape with theories and experiment on uh, low dimensional ecosystem should fail when we move to high dimensional ecosystem, whatever that means. And if you think that that should fail, uh, what specifically what intuitions about a low dimensional ecosystem is wrong for high dimensional one. So I, I will proceed for with the, this round of answer in uh, alphabetical orders, like at school. <laughs> so uh, starting with uh, Stefano. Yes. So it is obvious even to a theoretician that no place in the world contains one, two or three species, right? And yet, if you take like a book of theoretical ecology, 95% of the material is dedicated to the case of one, two or three species. So, so I, besides this obvious fact, right? That, that, that there are very, very many species in the world, like in the in tropical rainforest, can, we can find 10,000 species of trees. What, what, what strikes me as very interesting uh, is uh, whether we can use exactly the same tools that we use for small scale uh, ecosystem imagine like experiments in a laboratory with one or two or three species to understand what happens when we have 10,000 species my, my, my career basically was a bet on the fact that we cannot 
really extend the same like type of theories that we did for 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 like small dimensional system to large dimensional systems and we have clear cases where our intuition fails when we move that to more than a handful of species for example like the celebrated rule of intraspecific being larger than interspecific uh, competition in two uh, dimensional systems in lotka volterra does not hold when n is greater than two generally Great. So, uh, Daniel Fisher. Well, I guess as as implied by the title of my series, I think the answer is is clearly uh, um, uh, clearly yes. I mean, I, I think in many ways the most dramatic examples are not having many species that um, uh, coexist, but having enormous number of strains. Um, which which coexist and compete directly with each other, and by almost any bacterial system that has been that has been looked at, one finds a huge number of strains you know, really coexisting in space and uh, um, um, in space and time. And trying to, to understand that in terms of in thinking in terms of niches, that somehow one starts from a picture where each um, type interacts more strongly with its own type than it does with others, which is a lot of the beginnings of a lot of the work on high dimensional ecosystems. I think that's sort of fundamentally um, fundamentally wrong, unless that is really an evolved characteristic of the system that somehow drives it towards um, um, uh, to, towards that. Um, so I think at this point, I mean, certainly having worked on it, um, you know, a limited amount, my intuition is is really poor as to the things that can uh, um, happen in in um, in high dimensions. I just want to actually mention just one example from you know, recent work on on evolution of uh, microbes. It really sort of shows how different it can uh, um, can be. Um, the sort of the, you know traditional view is that you can get mostly neutral drift and occasionally get a, a sweep, a selective sweep. Um, but the other alternative is just there's always a, it's always evolving. The populations are always evolving, even without much diversity driven by um, ecological um, interaction. And the picture emerges is very different. And there's something you know, the, the predictions for statistics of diversity and so on are, are very different. It took a long time to get to the point where we had enough theoretical understanding to start saying which predictions might be somewhat universal, not dependent on all the uh, um, details, but we do have some understanding of, of that. And so I think it's going to take a while with the ecology to know, you know, what ways one might try to make contact with uh, um, um, with data, or, what, or which things one should find surprising, which things one shouldn't find surprising, and so on. But I think, you know, Phil Anderson's more is different, um, absolutely applies, um, applies here, and it, it really needs developing different intuition and different methods. Great. So, uh, Jonathan? Um. Sure. So, um, I, I think the question is, as you say, sort of a leading one. Um, but but I, I think that it's worth sort of dissecting the question and turn it to two levels of organization. And one is to say, you know, while certainly nature around us is quite diverse, the question might be rephrased as, is it fair to say that we can understand that diversity as some sort of simple combination of what are ultimately fundamentally pairwise interactions. So while the individual lock and terror rules between two species are not going to, you know, are not going to change in a many species system, the generalizations we have about you know, what it takes to get coexistence intra and inter might collapse, but, but our overall framework is still okay. Um, I think the more fundamental question is really you know, when species are in these more diverse systems, do we really experience what some are calling higher order interactions where you really have the simultaneous uh, interaction of multiple species impacting a third and fourth and so on. And I think the jury is still out on that one. I, I, th I, think, I think it's easy to answer the first question and say, yeah, you know, if you build it, you string together a bunch of pairwise interactions, you can't use the simple rules that you develop from simple you know, pairwise ecology to, to understand dynamics. But the big, uh, but I think we'll get over that. I think we'll figure that out eventually. I don't, I don't find it a sort of an insurmountable question. Um, but what, what is really challenging is to say, is even the notion that we should be able to understand diverse communities as these sort of combinations of pairs is something we don't know. And, 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 and you know, and, and you can even, you know, another way of saying is obviously these models are meant sort of to abstract some underlying mechanistic interaction between species, whether it's through resources or consumers or allelopathic chemicals, whatever you like. And the question might be, when you think about those mechanisms, are those mechanisms one, which you think can be described in this pairwise fashion or ultimately require these more complex structures? 
And I think we don't know enough about nature and about how those methods are really driving dynamics in nature to even answer that question. But that might be the pathway that I would try to kind of veer towards getting some progress on the question at that at that hardware level is what I might say. Great. So, uh, Matteo. Okay, so uh, first of all, well, I think um, I should say um, from the personal experience, uh, the a situation where your intuition fails is a very fortunate one <laughs> because uh, uh, it means that uh, really there is something fundamental uh, uh, to, to be understood. And, but there are two sides of this question. One is uh, uh, our intuition about models. Uh, I mean, when, when we study a very complex model and uh, whether uh, what we expect uh, is what actually turns out. And the other thing is, intuition about a real system. So I will not talk about real systems because I've always been dealing with models, but I have a, an experience uh, with uh, models uh, where uh, essentially my intuition was uh, right half uh, percent of the time. Uh, you, you could flip a coin <laughs> and, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, and in the end, the, the answer, the true answer was either yes, your intuition is right, or no. I mean, and these type of models are uh, precisely of the type uh, that uh, many people have been describing. Uh, many people are now describing in this, this community. And uh, uh, when my um, uh, work was more related to models of financial markets and minority games, but these are essentially resource uh, disorder system, very heterogeneous uh, systems uh, with uh, um, many different agents, uh, essentially uh, living on many resources. Of course, the models now that are being studied by Danny and, and others uh, are more complicated because uh, there is also chaos. Uh, but these are the type of models that in my experience show you really teach you something. It can, they can really teach you a new paradigm, a new type of how you should think uh, in high dimensions. And I think from what I saw in, in this school, uh, this uh, I see remarkable uh, advances. It's a very exciting time to be, to be studying uh, uh, ecological systems and high dimensional uh, models uh, in ecology because I see uh, uh, models and ecology and, and experiments really coming much closer together than, than in the past. Great, uh, Mercedes. Yes, thank you. Yes, it, it, it has been a quite an exciting uh, course and also uh, one that uh, that gives rise to many questions and ideas. So, on the on the question you just asked, I would say yes and no. Uh, yes, because I think many of the models we have had in the past uh, do not help us with the very high dimensional systems, but they provide a, a basis to organize some some ideas and some uh, concepts. And I think we heard about that, for example, in the context of. Um, the stabilization and equalization forces. Uh, there are very good reviews by Saavedra, by Barabas, by D'Andrea showing that it's highly non-trivial to extend those ideas and we can't, don't know how to do it to, to high dimensions. Uh, but yet I think the organization of, of, for example, the different kinds of traits that we have to consider that that, er, that, that sort of low dimensional theory illustrated was very useful. On a different point, I think uh, uh, I like to think, of course, about assembly in this uh, eco-evolutionary perspective. And there, I think the question of when we say hi, I think there are some discontinuities and that what motivates our studies, I mean, Daniel just mentioned the, the very interesting, of course, uh, microbial systems with the strain diversity. But if we move from the microbial world to the systems that really have motivated us to look at diversity, the rainforest, the coral reefs, we are looking at hyper diverse systems. And if you add the intra specific variation, it's enormous. And the network of interactions 
is enormous. And I just like to think when I think about pathogens and I call them in my lecture hyperdiverse, I like to emphasize that biogeography has done the experiments of assembly. And if you take certain pathogens where, where there is very high transmission, they are completely different in diversity than when you have low transmission. And I'm talking about continental differences and discontinuity in the differences. And when I say that is, I say that because I think oh, I will make, I think the most important or to me, the most interesting point at this moment, I'm deeply convinced and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm deeply convinced at the moment that we cannot build hyperdiverse systems at one level of organization without the the high the very high dimensionality and diversity at the at the lower level from which we build it. So I think like the diversity of the traits and the genetic variation in a that underlies the ecological interactions. Has, all, has to also be very large in places where we assemble a large number of strains or species. And this is not trivial because then it, it leads to the question of what maintains this high diversity of the building blocks. And I think it's fundamental because uh, I showed you an example in, in malaria where, I, where we know that if we drive the system down in transmission, there is actually a threshold at which we lose the ability of maintaining the building blocks. And I think that when we go from very diverse to the more trivial low, low transmission systems, we are crossing a threshold of that kind. And so I'm saying it's, it's, it's hyper-diverse at different levels of organization. And this is not by chance. It's because select the same force, the same selection is operating at different levels of organization. So I think that, that if that is true, we need to understand it because it's something very different for very hyper-diverse systems that truly makes a distinction with uh, the ones that just uh, exist in, in, you know, below this threshold. And uh, anyhow, that, that is my, my pitch here. I think those systems are truly distinct. That's very clear. And uh, uh, Daniel, it's great. Okay, so uh, I'll start by saying that, I mean, the kind of intuition I wanna bring forward is something that guides the way I think about this, but also fails uh, at higher dimensionality has to do with metabolism in, in microbial communities. And in particular, you know, sometimes you may find that uh, if an organism is very good at using a carbon source, another is very good at using the nitrogen source, then you can think of the complementarities that arise in communities. But of course, the molecular complexity in, in real environments is much more complicated than, but, you know, than this. And there are number of molecules that contain the different elements and microbes that are very good at using this resource or that resource. And, and this economy of the molecules becomes uh, really complicated. And I think one of the challenges that I see is that, um, you know, on one hand, I think it's valuable and interesting to build detailed models of each individual organisms and try to push that to the boundary of higher and higher complexity. But of course, at some point, this becomes too much because we don't have enough information. It's challenging in many ways. So the question I think is how do we find a good balance between the detailed models where we know um, how the metabolism of each individual organism works and the more you know, distribution-based models where we try to capture the general properties of the uh, how different microbes interact with each other. And I, and I think that this is crucial because I believe that metabolism can be, first of all, as I said, very complex, give rise to um, um, higher order interactions. Uh, but there is also the fact that when, when we want to study individual communities for all the different applications that microbiome research has, uh, it could be this strain rather than that strain that makes you sick or this strain that can really produce the oxygen that can change the atmosphere of a planet. So the details matter for a lot of you know, the reasons we care about communities, the, the details matter. So I think it's important to strike a good balance between the statistical properties of communities and detailed knowledge of metabolism. 
And the other thing that I want to say, even if I, you know, sometimes I, I like to hope that metabolism is really the driving force of a lot of these communities. And I think it is in many ways, but, you know, there are many other ways in which microbes interact that I think are so complicated and, and are barely taken into account into models uh, uh, from signals and quorum sensing, contact interactions, uh, the interactions that depends, depends on space and time. Uh, so I think this is all, uh, you know, an unexplored territory in terms of uh, figuring out how, you know, whether and how to take all of that into account. And I'll stop here. Great, so uh, it's now Justin and then yeah, no, I, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, a lot of the, the model approaches that we take are designed to ask very specific questions and we have to simplify uh, most of reality into these toys to, to be able to, to say something straightforward or to understand the models themselves, which can already sometimes be ununderstandable, um, as, as Matteo was saying. And um, I think that clouds, you know, that allows us to point in very specific directions and aim these tools to, to answer very specific questions, but it, but it cuts out the reality of systems. Um, you know, the, the fact that there really isn't anything as, as you know, we, we put these species into a node or we say this node represents a species, but you know, there's just individuals and there's, you know, within the individuals, there's, uh, you know, genomes and uh, they're all interacting in various ways over very complex environments that are ever changing. Um, we might look at systems where we're considering only the biotic interactions between species, but uh, and those are complex enough, but then we think about the feedback that biotic organisms, you know, the biotic side of the equation has with the abiotic side of the equation and that uh, they're different within species, but also within individuals in, in terms of having an impact over both ecological and evolutionary time. So I, I think it's perhaps unsurprising that, you know, our models fall short, um, but, but as you add more dimensionality to some of the problems, it, it really expands the possibilities. And I, I often, you know, think back um, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about uh, organisms living in these diverse communities, so, some of the first um, diverse communities, we, we go back to the Cambrian explosion. Uh, what, what led to that explosion? What was it like before the explosion? And what was, what, what was the kind of instigator of the explosion? Was it the evolution of eyes and suddenly opening this entirely new um, kind of sensory experience of the world that allows organisms to move through over in terms of their evolutionary trajectories? Um, I, I had a conversation with Charles Marshall at, at Berkeley, and he described this this process as uh, billowing lava, you know, underneath uh, the ocean, like the the this changing niche space, ever kind of expanding and evolving um, with the organisms that that are that are using it. And I, you know, I, I guess to me that that gives a sense of um, near <laughs> infinite combinations of of interactions that that lead to this diversity and. You know, again, I guess the last thing I'll say is that when, when we look at these uh, model systems, we, we make these assumptions often of, uh, you know, asymptotic time horizons and stability. And, but these systems are getting uh, hit from every side all the time. Um, they're in a constant state of flux and change, and um, they often disobey the very assumptions that we're, we're making to, to be able to say something and anything. Um, about very specific questions that the models are appropriate for, uh, but inappropriate for others. Thanks, Justin. There is a, uh, a comment from Daniel Fisher. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to comment on, on various um, uh, aspects. Firstly, I mean, I certainly resonate very much both with what Mercedes said about the being not strictly being a threshold for complexity, but somehow when things get complexity enough, there's maybe some sort of runaway to getting more complex. And if they're not, they're sort of stuck. And this maybe also relates to Justin and things, things early on. Um, just another um, just comment about intuition from statistical physics and what it might tell one and what it doesn't. So I guess I would disagree with Jonathan. My instinct is that things like whether there are three species interactions or two species is something which is one of the details it can change things, but it sort of won't make things somehow qualitatively um, um, uh, qualitatively different. But I think there are some things where the intuition from the physics is very bad, and that's particularly the sort of instabilities of systems to sort of runaway event, right? A pathogen that comes in, a new species that comes in, does very well, changing things dramatically. And then I think, and Justin's comments about the crucial bits of being the whole system being 
um, uh, being very much uh, um, dynamic rather than thinking of it as being sort of quasi uh, um, uh, quasi static. And then the other the other bit, and the, you know, this is relevant for for uh, coral reefs, but even more dramatically from uh, cyanobacteria. Um, the um, the it's one organism having a very big effect, or a small evolutionary change in one organism, a seemingly small one, have enormous effect on everything. And so somehow, even if one wants to abstract out quite a lot of the details, there's still going to be some sort of dominant things and dominant interactions and so on. And I think, again, I, I mean, I find some of those ones are some of the things that are hard coming from physics to make it crisp, uh, get a grip of. I mean, some of the details clearly matter, but I think the hope is that a lot of them don't. If one knows what questions to ask, right? And if one set, defines sort of the kinds of questions as being ones where you can apply them to many systems without having to redevelop everything, I think, I mean, those kind of questions, I think one has reason for optimism that, uh, um, you know, not, not everything will depend on the, on, on all of the, of, of the details. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, you want to comment on that? I mean, I, I, I think my comment, um, you know, is, is more a question of an empirical one than, than one that maybe is about sort of what is possible theoretically. I, I, I agree with Daniel that I think that it might not fundamentally change the rules because we might have to have some different expectations. Um, but but uh, I, 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 guess, I guess what I really, what I really meant to communicate was just that, you know, when we try and understand nature, the question might be, um, how much do we need to actually incorporate these interactions that only emerge in diverse systems? And I just think the answer to that is unknown. Whether, they, wh whether incorporating them fundamentally changes the way we think about species diversity in, 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 in complex systems, I wouldn't want to propose at this point, partly because we don't even know what those rules are. Um, and I can tell you that, for example, like I have a PhD student that's currently working on questions about, you know, what even are our expectations for how uh, a three-way interaction or a higher interaction might modulate uh, the dynamics of coexistence. And you get some really funny things. Um, now, whether they're any funnier than they would be if you had stringed together a bunch of pairwise interactions, I, I don't know if that's fair to say. But it's certainly something that violates what we have from the simple two species ecology that we um, that we focus on. So, so you know, I, I I think I basically agree with Daniel that I'm not sure there's something there's actually a, a real sort of game change here. The question might be just how much do we have to incorporate these dynamics or these interactions if we want to understand the dynamics of diverse systems. They just well, don't I think it, yeah. yeah. I think I think it could be now to turn it around and, and agree with what you with what you said earlier is it could be that there are some of these more complex interactions that are crucial that somehow sort of drive the environment that everyone else is feeling and everyone else is writing on writing on top of and so I think in that sense it's some of the things which in certain in, in certain ways it could be it could end up being pretty uh, crucial for. You know, to, for a particular system that could also be towards this driving towards sort of getting enough complexity that everything else can somehow complexify on top of that, diversify on top of that. Yeah. Yes, Mercedes wanted to say something. Yes, I, I, um, I, I'm this whole issue of the, the, the dominant processes and that we may hope to understand with models uh, is very related also I think with the issue of what do what do can we, obviously what can we hope to understand with models in these very very complex systems, and and in my view probably what I would call progress is if we can not really hope to understand these interactions in any bottom up fashion that will be credible because I think it's an impossible goal. I think ultimately, if we can, for example, reject neutral theory and understand that we may be in, in a situation of niche construction that is the complete opposite, then I would ask, then how do we look at data to know this? How do, you, how do we look at data to know how far we are from a threshold where, where we will not lose demography, but we will lose diversity? Those are questions that I think we can approach without understanding the mechanisms. We need to understand which microscopic properties give away the dominant forces. And what does that tell us? I think anything else is hopeless. I think we will never understand the interactions that have been built to maintain a rain, rainforest. I truly think we will never understand them. But I think we will understand the consequences. We will understand the phenomenology. And I say this because I, I really like a paper by Mark Lipschitz, uh, Pamela Martinez and others, where they see 
that they can predict the, the strains that respond to vaccination with uh, sort of considering the frequencies and certain forces that indicate that of the order of 3,000 or 4,000 non-core genes are involved in this. So what interactions are they creating? They are not even essential genes. They are not even the genes that define the strains, right? So they must be involved in a myriad interactions. Uh, if we look at 3,000 non-essential genes, and they give us some predictive ability just on the basis of frequencies. I think, anyhow, I just think that we have to return to this question that, of course, neutral theory would, the main thing of neutral theory was to show that the microscopic patterns we were stuck trying to study didn't tell us anything. They were not informative. So the question is which patterns are informative? And I think models, models will be very useful for this. So there is a, thank you, Mercedes. There is a comment from uh, uh, Matteo. Yeah, so if, if, if I may, I think this is a very important point because uh, uh, trying to understand, uh, uh, say, stylized facts in terms of uh, uh, systematic deviation from neutral theories, I think, uh, because I mean, my way of thinking of neutral theory is like a maximum entropy. Uh, model. So a model that where essentially uh, you, you cannot hope to learn anything about the microscopic uh, interactions uh, from the microscopic behavior. So I, I really think this, this uh, approach to address, uh, I mean, as uh, Danny was saying, I mean, uh, how do you find what is the right question? I, I think this is a general approach that could be useful. Yes, one question I guess is uh, whether neutral theory is the sort of a useful baseline for uh, understanding uh, understanding this dimensional system. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on, comment on this or on either other parts of what has been said. I think I think it's it's only useful in the sense that the, one of the questions is why do end, things end up looking that way, but they don't. They almost certainly won't look that way once one starts looking at the. Uh, um, the dynamics, but there are rather there are rather too many things that can give rise to distributions that look roughly neutral, uh, um, uh, neutral like. And you know, roughly speaking, it's like assuming that all of physics is like an ideal gas, which is you know, clearly isn't right. But it's somehow useful to make the observations and start looking at how things, what what aspects go go wrong. But I, I use the word neutral theory in a broad sense. Uh, so if you are interested in in asking, I have a, a bunch of data on this very complex system. How should I look at it? To ask not whether a process occurs, many processes occur, whether a process is dominant or important, even just important. Uh, then I need a neutral model where, where that, that is the appropriate neutral model for that question, for that process. And, and so, <laughs> But you mean you, you need a no model? Yeah, yeah, no yeah. Model. I'm using yeah. it. No, I don't yeah. know. Thank you. No, Thank no. you for, yeah. for the difference. Yeah, no, no, I agree. No. That's Absolutely. a very, but I think like we, we, can, we can make progress that way because we don't even know. Look, the clusters, the clusters that are predicted from stabilizing interactions, they disappear in equivolutionary models at very high dimensions. So my point is, if we ask, what should we even be looking at in data to say that that process is important? We don't know, but I think the models are useful there. Yes, with the appropriate null model. <laughs> so Stefano wanted to say something? Yes, like I, I, I agree with like Daniel on the distinction between neutral model and null model. And I think like that an underexplored null model that is not neutral would be a model with random interactions as opposed to no interactions. And my belief is that by and large, they would produce the same result as a purely neutral model, but removing like the need for, for the strong assumptions. Jonathan? Yeah, so I think, I think Mercedes raises some very good points and the conversation is going in a certain very pragmatic direction, I might say. But I think the challenge and especially a challenge for theoreticians as an empiricist primarily is to say, well, you know, 
it may be that the only source of progress with these hyperdiverse systems involves some sort of null model statistical physics kind of approach. But the problem is, is that many people really want to know why that tropical forest is diverse for some practical you know, reason for managing that forest and so on. And the question might be, how do we deal with that tension between what is potentially the most rational quantitative way forward in a system with many dynamical processes that are maintaining coexistence at some abstract level and the fact that someone wants to know, are the monkeys dispersing the seeds a critical component to the diversity that I observe in that forest? And you can't really answer that with a, with a, with a distribution or, a, or a, 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 a null model. So, so I think there's a real attention within ecology about what we're actually aiming for within this understanding of diversity of these hyper diverse systems. And the question is, you know, how, how, what is maybe the right approach or is there a meeting of the, of the minds on that kind of framework is what I might. Yeah, but I, I think there is, um, I'm with you, but if you mention the monkeys distributing the, the, the seeds, also be, you are thinking about some of the, the, the effects of the, the negative enemies that you can find in, in the major sort of stabilizing forces. Now, there is a more critical question. You may come to the conclusion and the most practical conclusion that if we that, that given the niche construction that is involved in maintaining that forest, the best we can do is not preserve the monkey, is do what E.O. Wilson is saying, preserve you know, parts of the, the landscape for, the, for, for nature. I think once you get to the point where you say these complex interactions underlie hyperdiversity, the only way to maintain it is to give it space and, and leave it working at that because these thresholds of hyper complexity, you are going to lose them if you don't give, if you don't give those systems enough, I'm going to call it abstractly space, enough uh, to, to essentially maintain this, uh, this, this diversity and this level of complexity. And I think the interactions are so rich and have been built over so, such long time with pieces that, that are built from eons of evolution, not the species, the pieces that constitute them. That if, we, that if we cross the thresholds to keep that diversity, we lose it all. I think the only practical solution, one of the components of a practical solution is not to ask, is this particular thing important? Is like, how do we save the, 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 the system as a whole, enough of the system as a whole? And I think that the 50-50 idea of E.O. Wilson, whether it needs to be 50-50, but I think uh, there is something very real there and very urgent. Well, Stefano, yes? Yeah, I, I agree with Mercedes on the practical aspect, but I, I think that this is really like raising the white flag to some extent, right? Like, so, so we're going back to a sense of like conservation in which we go back like to ancient texts and they say, this forest is sacred, no one can enter or only like the warriors can hunt in this forest or only like this period of the year if we can hunt in this forest. We, which is like saying, because we don't really understand what is important, what is not important. We just have to conserve the whole. No, no, I completely disagree. I'm saying that when we get to understand, it will be too late because we will understand that the only way to preserve it is to, is to leave it to, and I'm not saying pristine and don't touch it, but I'm saying you are going to, if you lose what maintains hypercomplexity, and I'm saying, I think we have enough in theory in the theories that exist to begin to see that this is the reason. It's not a white flag, it's exactly the opposite. It's the realization of the very rich niche construction that goes on in these systems and, and what, how you can lose it, right? I agree on the practical aspects. I disagree on, on the interpretation, but, but I okay. agree with you that that's the best thing. But it's not a white flag and it's not going back to the past. It's like, what is the theory tell us today? So uh, on this issue about the, the pieces of the interaction and the building blocks, I'd like to hear from uh, um, Daniel Segre and uh, uh, regarding the, the, the building blocks of many interactions, for instance, in bacteria and from uh, Justin about the fact that then these building blocks 
of the interaction sometimes have like sort of underlying um, regularities and uh, and uh, that emerge, emerge through scaling. So, um, Daniel? Uh, uh, one thing I can say is, right, metabolism is what it is, right? It, it is a well-defined system. It's the outcome of, you know, 4 billion years of, of evolution. And, and I think there are two sides of this. One is that because of its underlying structure, it, it shapes the way microbes sense their environment and respond to their environment in a very specific way. Um, and I think that maybe, and I really truly don't know, I'm, I'm curious of you know, whether ultimately we'll find that if you could build alternative metabolisms, uh, the, the rules of uh, the, the, the way communities work would be similar, but I, but I, say, I think that there, it is important and there may be aspects of this that strongly depend on the specific structure of metabolism, the way it, it works. Um, and the other aspect of this is that, which I think also is somewhere in between the ex extreme uh, statistical nature of complexity and the extreme detailed one, which is that um, th there are classes of bacteria and microbes that have specific types of metabolism. So uh, maybe we will not need to understand the met metabolic capabilities of each individual organism, but maybe having a categor categorization of uh, guilds or, or types of metabolic activities might be helpful. Uh, and it is also true that people keep discovering new metabolic pathways, new capabilities that were not known before. Um, uh, you know, things that seem quite amazing, like new pathways for utilization of organic acids, uh, and people engineer new pathways. There are newly engineered pathways for carbon fixation. So looking also forward at, at this you know, rising field of synthetic ecology, where we can try and uh, build new communities based on what we know, I think striking a good balance between detail and, and, uh, and the uh, statistical nature of, of communities might, would be important. I don't know if this addresses your question, uh, Jacopo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a good, uh, good comment. And uh, before I leave the, the, the word to, to Justin to sort of give an, another uh, perspective on, on uh, uh, metabolic uh, metabolism or metabolic theory, I, I'd like to um, uh, ask all the participants if they want to ask questions to please type them or raise their hand. So, uh, Justin. Yeah, I, you know, one, one of the things that really um, is striking to me and I think deserves a lot of attention is is how um, th this idea of redundancy in systems and how organisms can adapt to fulfill similar functions as others uh, as, as they disappear or are replaced, et cetera. Um, an example of this is fruit dispersers in South America. Um, fruit, a lot of larger fruit was dispersed by larger mammals, for example, like the gompatheres and the avocado uh, example. And then when those organisms disappeared, uh, the dispersal of those fruits was replaced by by humans and and then later by domesticated animals. Um, and so we have like these these interact interaction niches that um, change over time and are dynamic over time, even within the you know the the time scale of a of a species with without including evolution, um, these ecological uh, plasticity. Um, that isn't really realized until the community itself changes. Um, I think uh, I think understanding how these large, uh, diverse systems operate um, in the face of disturbance um, really is, to some extent, a product of to what extent there can be redundancy um, that may only be realized, you know, post disturbance. Um, and so I think, you know, we our understanding of the dimensionality of interactions is often very simple. Um, you know, we, we describe interactions in, in one or two dimensions. Um, and in reality, the interactions themselves can be very diverse in their effects um, and change over time uh, in response to how the system changes. Great. Yes, th th this point about redundancy, I think it's uh, uh, like 
um, sort of connected in some sense an alternative, at least I see uh, it like that, but perhaps I'm wrong, with what Mercedes is, uh, is saying about uh, the I dimensional functional space and I dimensional trait space, right? So if there is a redundancy, it means that somehow the trait space, the functional space is low dimensional and there are multiple uh, ways to realize a given function. So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this dichotomy, whether it is a dichotomy. Or... I think there's a, there's a general question here also, which is the how much complexity at the sort of phenotypic level and the interactions are needed to get a very diverse um, a very diverse community. And that one is not, I think is not at all clear. I think it's, you know, for example, can it be that a rather small number of chemicals associated with the metabolism are really already sufficient um, to get you a, uh, um, a high diversity or simple features of uh, pathogen host uh, um, interaction? Is that already, um, um, uh, is that already enough? So I think that's not uh, um, clear. I think the issue about somehow the redundancy and it seems to be one part where this is absolutely crucial, but which is connected to all this is in the, the evolution level, the fact that there are very many different ways that an organism can do somewhat better in a given environment. Right? And then for any ways it's gonna change its sort of organismic um, phenotype, there are very many changes that it can do, the possible genetic changes and then sort of at the you know, nanophenotype level that uh, um, uh, can give rise to that or to give rise to something close to uh, um, close to that. And that may end up sort of having consequences that there are always going to be different ways of replacing certain of the, the functions of that sort of redundancy. But I think that's another one of those sort of, you know, big number of things that we don't understand at all, that it tends to get way underemphasized. And certainly a game theory, unfortunately, does this, is that there are extremely large number of possible strategies in a, a, in a loose sense, right? And that, that, that's a really important uh, um, um, important part of the, the evolution and presumably of the, the ecology. Yes. Anyone wants to comment on this or another part? I guess what maybe one comment is that I think there is really, you know, this idea that functions rather than taxa ultimately dominate the uh, community dynamics. I think to me is really fascinating. And uh, and it is in the end about redundancy because uh, genomes may have this mosaics of functions and how exactly these functions are coupled in different genomes uh, is an outcome of uh, horizontal gene transfer, long-term evolution and so on. So understanding whether there are um, aspects of this that, that have been optimized throughout uh, evolution, I think is very interesting. and. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. I think this is largely unexplored and still. Well, I think there is an experimental question there, which I suggested to my colleague, Michael Fischbach, who works on, on, uh, on gut microbes and has these consor consortia of 60 gut microbes in the, in the lab, which he claims fill up all the niches. Now, my other colleague, Alfred Foreman, says there's no such thing as bacterial um, niches, and one can't think of it that way. But I, I asked Michael, I said, can you do an experiment where you take one of the bacteroides and put a lot of the other functions into it. So you move a lot of the, the operons that are supposed to be crucial of the niches filled by the other ones. And is it possible that one organism can at least, you know, roughly fulfill, um, uh, fulfill many, do many of those functions all at once? And then there's the immediate question is if you then let the system evolve, does it immediately diversify in, you know, the, into a whole bunch of organisms that do them better, each, um, each do them better? So I think there are some things that one could really try to actually do experimentally on that in you know moderately complex um, um, uh, complex communities. I think one of the other important things to consider is just the the importance of the constraints in the system. Um, you know, consider uh, the Rubisco protein and how little it's changed over so much time. Um, it, you think really you can't think there there isn't something better that that could evolve. But it's almost this evolutionary kind of dead end. Obviously, it's a very successful uh, protein in doing what it does. But organisms have found incredibly complex ways around to get around the constraints uh, set by by carbon fixation, um, designing entire physiologies to rec reconstruct early atmospheres to be more efficient uh, within their tissues. And um, you know, I think a lot of diversity I think stems from 
uh, the li limitations in the system, just having strong constraints and then uh, many pathways around those constraints uh, that different types of organisms have to follow. And that might not have been the case if, if there was always a better, uh, if there wasn't a constraint and everything was following the same pathway towards a uh, higher and higher fitness peak. And then each evolutionary accident as to which direction is taken constrains and opens up possibilities for all the future directions. Right? Isn't that So anyone else wants to add something on this or someone from the participants if they want to ask a question since we have 10 minutes toward the end? And nobody wants to ask anything. So I, I, I mean, one uh, uh, sort of direction that uh, has been uh, uh, sort of uh, a little bit explored in this discussion, but perhaps can be unpacked a little bit more is a question that actually emerged during one of the lectures, which uh, is exactly related to, uh, to uh, evolution and evolution of uh, diverse communities. So what are the conditions uh, uh, under which evolution produced these highly diverse uh, communities? So we, we said uh, these uh, trade-offs and constraints. So I don't know if uh, anyone wants to comment on that and add something. I'll say something. I, I think this is actually a case where Mercedes's original point that there are some useful abstractions from the two species case to end species that could be useful because if there is going to be some diversification, it's going to be one splitting into two in a simplistic sense of the word. I know it's more complicated. And presumably those two do interact more intensely than they, than, 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 each, than, than they do with anybody else in that system. And I think it's very interesting in the sense that We've very, been very good at trying to think about this problem in terms of some sort of stabilization regulation of the coexistence that emerges from those two species that, 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 that form. Um, but we've really not paid much attention to what comes out of some very simple two species coexistence work, which is that there is probably some competitive imbalance as well. And, and something about the need to think about that competitive imbalance axis at the same time as we think about the um, the stabilizing niche differentiation, if you want to call it that, um, axis is probably worthwhile and hasn't been done. And you probably wouldn't have thought of that had you not gone through a theoretical ecology experience in, in, at some point in your in your career, if that makes sense. So interestingly, you know, people have been so good at focusing on one axis of the problem and not really thinking about the other. Um, and, I, and I think that, that, that really has a real gap in what we are approaching on this problem right now, theoretically and empirically. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I, I mean, I agree. And I, I think the one of the reasons I, I sort of want to focus on on strains or you know, two species with lots of interacting strains, it's sort of the beginning of the of the diversification. And one hopes that the number one doesn't need all the ways in which many complex species interact with each other if one understands more some of the basic ones in which um, two, you know, two species do and then what can happen. Um, um, what can happen within them, and in some ways, it's you know learning to walk b b before one tries to, to to run. And I think you know my sense is we're still at a stage for to, for understanding diversity and so on of really crawling, right? I mean, we we we're trying to get up on our feet and sort of go some stumble steps um, forward. And I think there's where you know there's there's luck and experience and various other things of sort of choosing systems and models and so on which might. Um, go one, uh, make one go forward. I think one of the really nice things from this school is it's become clear the sort of, you know, diversity of ways of, of, uh, of approaching um, these kind of problems, even from people with relatively s similar backgrounds, at least superficially, right? And, and, and of course, all of things from different, um, um, uh, from, from different backgrounds. So I think these exchanges, if, one, if everyone agreed on what was important, it would be totally boring and we would almost certainly all be wrong. <laughs> well, I totally agree. Uh... Yes, Mercedes, you want to say something? Well, I think Daniel touched on an interesting question because uh, we, we either heard about species or we heard about strains because that's convenient and we are kind of avoiding the, the sort of uh, macroevolutionary question in a sense of how, how do you connect the two? And, uh, and of course, uh, that is very interesting because even in the world of strains, uh, what also evolves is the reproductive, already the reproductive isolation in systems with incredible recombination, for example, 
there are groupings of genes, for example, that recombine more with each other and, uh, and some that are more conserved and so on. So this building of the barriers, even within, for example, pathogen strains that we assort and recombine, it's not like a free for all. And this, uh, we see this, uh, even at that level, the buildup of, of these barriers, which I think is a very important part of this, uh, of this evolutionary process. And I think it's another area we don't fully understand. And it's, you know, how do we go also, of course, it's the old question going from the micro evolution to the macro evolution, but, and this, uh, that I think is a fascinating question because I don't think it's so discontinuous uh, I mean, you, you also see it within strains, sorry. Yes, uh, Justin, you want to say something about uh, this uh, sort of macro, macro evolutionary aspect and uh, deep time uh, changes? Um, yeah, well, I, I, I guess, um, I guess I would just argue that, um, that a lot of the energetic constraints, a lot of the kind of simplistic perspectives that we put into how we capture, um, how interactions shape systems, um, they're, they're at least might be able to argue that they're better um, when evaluating macroevolutionary systems uh, because you're really looking at these big general trends and you've zoomed far, far away from kind of the noise of ecological systems. And I kind of coming from a deep time perspective, I um, always am concerned about how much we're focusing on contemporary uh, ecosystems um, much, much more than we tend to, to look at kind of these average quantities of systems that the fossil record um, averages out for us. Um, and, and so in some sense, kind of the, the fossil record um, and, and, and the deep time perspective, it's, it's, it's already isolating out some of the biggest signals. Um, and to, to what extent are we trying to apply these very simplified models to noisier systems that are much more difficult to try to understand, it's kind of like trying to predict uh, where a molecule of gas is with, um, you know, uh, very in the average gas law. You know, it's it's, it's impossible. Um, but but we do find, I think, um, if you if we try to integrate more of a deep time perspective and take advantage of systems that have uh, been around for a long time and the average uh, signals that the the signals that they leave behind, which are which have to be averaged. Um, we, we might be able to uh, leverage kind of ecological theory um, in different ways. Thanks a lot, Justin. Uh, anyone wants to add? Uh, um, Maybe I'll add, yeah. I'll add something. I, I think this is a mac macroecological perspective of a very different kind, but um, one of the things that I like to think of is the you know, you can view microbial metabolism as a planetary phenomenon, of course. And, and now from a very different perspective, that sounds like science fiction, but people look at the atmospheres of extrasolar planets right, in search for kinds of life. And, and the, there's a lot of interesting research on, you know, non-equilibrium of chemical systems on these extrasolar planets. And I think that it's really interesting to think how, um, you know, the overall chemistry at, a, at that such large scale it's just an influx of energy from, from light and given the, the molecules that are present, uh, how does that link to the you know, scale of microbial metabolism we were used to think of and, and the microbial ecology uh, side of this. And, and I think there is also room for what I think is really interesting way of thinking about this in terms of just, you know, besides the details of the chemistry in terms of you know, the flow of electrons um, that, that are kicked up by solar energy and, and gradually uh, find their way down to lower energy levels. Uh, and, I, and I think there is a lot of potential for linking this large scale theories of non-equilibrium 
um, biospheres to, to the lower level uh, microbial metabolism uh, models. I know this is a little bit out there, but I think it's something interesting. Yeah. Great, so we have uh, all less than one minute. So uh, anyone wants to give some uh, final thoughts? Or any question from the participant? I just have one, one comment. I think is one of the things which often doesn't get into papers is really the sort of struggle for the good question. If you, and certainly doesn't get into um, got proposals I've discovered, or at least they get rejected if they do have those things. Um, and somehow the, the writing sort of more things down about not just, okay, this is the question. This is just my sort of struggling to try to make good questions out of these, out of these very, Things. And when things normalize a bit, I've been meaning for a long time to get a, a series um, of talks um, going called Bio Y, something called Bio X, it stands for. Um, they're called Bio Y, where with a letter Y, but where it would really mean the WHY, and really trying to get people to talk about questions that they didn't even quite know what the question was yet. And I think this, 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 you know, this discussion has been really good um, um, that way, but I, it's, it'd be really nice to if people. You know, um, the community generally um, um, took effort to write such things, um, um, uh, uh, write, write things down, and maybe collectively, it would be fun. Yeah. Mercedes, you want to say something or you are muted? Oh, no, I was listening for, oh, okay. <laughs> for a while. Okay. Well, there is actually one question from a participant, uh, Monday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, the panelists, for um, giving us the round table talk. Please, I want to get a real take home message regarding this uh, intuition and modeling. I, uh, is it that when you want to model, you need to first of all have your intuition on what exactly you want to get or is it the other way around? Uh, please, I need, uh, I need a key uh, take a message so that I can get something and get it clearly from here. Thank you. Anyone wants to respond? Thanks so very much for the question. I, I can only speak for myself, but I, when I start designing um, a modeling approach, I, I usually think I know what I want to get. And that often isn't what I get. And it changes my understanding of what I was actually wanting in the first place. Um, so for me anyway, it's a, it's a method of kind of uh, clarifying what I know and what I don't know. And it usually doesn't, what I think what I want to know when I begin doesn't match up exactly where I end up, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, anyone wants to add something or ask a question? Great. So if not, I want to thank uh, uh, Stefano, Daniel, Jonathan, Matteo, Mercedes, Daniel, it's a great, and uh, Justin for uh, this uh, very nice uh, uh, discussion. Um, I think we could go on with this discussion for other 50 hours. And uh, in fact, uh, we, uh, with Mercedes and Matteo, uh, we have decided to have a, a follow-up of this, uh, of this uh, school, which will be a workshop to be held again online in a month from now. So we can uh, sort of take a break from Zoom and screens. And uh, I think all the participants will receive information about that. And there will be a lot of space uh, in that workshop to discuss about uh, uh, diversity and the limits to uh, diversity assembly. So uh, with that, I, well, Again, thanks to all the panelists. I also want to thank all the participants. There are now 60 people connected to this Zoom. And looking at the names, I saw that most of the people actually attended like all the 52 sessions. So that was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and I really appreciated that. Uh, I mean, also the interaction with you was great. Um, I'd like to thank beyond the, the, the lecturers of this uh, session, all the, all the people that uh, lectures and gave talk during this, uh, this school. Their contribution was, uh, was, uh, was great. And I think there was a lot of material that uh, 
has been put forward that could be available for many people that wants to enter in this field or, or uh, uh, understand what are, the, what are the challenges and the opportunities for research. I'd like also to thank the people in the, in the sort of uh, uh, in the background that uh, you probably have not seen. I'd like to thank Monica, Victoria and Adriana, the secretaries of the school. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Massimo Maffione who uh, gave the IT support and really stayed here for 52 sessions. So, uh, and uh, at the end, I'd like to thank uh, Matteo, Simon Levin and Antonio for organizing this with me. So this is the end. Thank you very much. Uh, now stay away from Zoom for a while. And uh, I hope to see you either virtually or hopefully uh, physically here in Trieste soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.